Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am calling to order our Administration and Enterprise Oversight Committee for today, uh, Monday, April 15th, 2024. I'm Robin Wonsley, and I'm also the chair of this committee. Um, I will now have the clerk call the roll to make sure we have a quorum. Councilmember Vital? Present. Ellison? Here. Cashman is absent. Chuktai is absent. Vice Chair Palmasano? Present. And Chair Wansley? Present. We have four present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum, and I do want to uh, share that both uh, Council Member Cashman and Council Vice President uh, Chuktai did inform me about their absence prior to today. Um, with that, we can transition into our consent agenda, which has 14 items, which I'll now read for the record. Uh, the first being a passage of resolution for a gift acceptance from the Honor Guard Foundation of Travel Expenses. Two is a passage of resolution for a gift acceptance from Metropolitan Police Department of Travel Expenses. Three is a passage of resolution for a gift acceptance from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention of Travel and Lodging Expenses. Four is a passage of resolution for a gift acceptance from the National Association of City Transportation Officials for Travel Stipend, Conference Registration, and Travel and Lodging Expenses. Five is accepting bid for pond land care vegetation management. Six is accepting bid for upgrades of St. Anthony ADA pedestrian ramps. Seven is accepting bid for 2024 concrete sidewalk replacement program. Eight is accepting bid for a small uh, diameter pipe cleaning and televising. Nine is authorizing contract amendment with Versacon Inc. for the Target Center Grab and Go Market Construct Services. Ten is authorizing contract amendment with Short Elliott Hendrickson Inc. for engineering and design services for Nicollet Ave Street construction and bridge reconstruction. Eleven is authorizing contract amendment with Morcon Construction Inc for the ceiling and lighting upgrade phase four project. 12 is authorizing a contract amendment with Eureka Construction Inc. for the Upper Harbor Terminal Dowling Avenue North Construction Project. 13 is authorizing contract amendment with Thomas and Sons Construction Inc. for the Lower Dowling Avenue 33rd Ave and West River Road Construction Project. 14 is approving legal settlement for Donald Williams v. City of Minneapolis at all. And that is all the items. I will see if there's any questions or discussion on all those items. Seeing no discussion or question, I will move approval of the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those not in favor say nay. All right, the ayes have it in. Um, the consent agenda is approved. Now, uh, getting to the discussion part, uh, we have several items here. The first is item 15, which will be on the 2024 open streets. Um, I will now have staff come forward to give a brief presentation related to these contracts. Um, thank you so much. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Chair Wansley, Vice Chair Palmasano, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Ballard. I am the uh, Enterprise Events Manager for the City of Minneapolis. And we come to you today to discuss um, the uh, 2024 Open Streets events. Um, back on January 22nd, we um, issued an RFP. Uh, we received six proposals uh, from, um, and we chose uh, four event organizers out of those six proposals. And we're asking uh, today um, to, um, uh, uh, that, that we move forward with approving the contracts for uh, three of those. Uh, we did not get a, uh, any proposals for the Northeast uh, central location. Um, we did select an event organizer 
uh, for Franklin Avenue, um, <clears throat> which was um, our streets. And um, after receiving the city contract, they withdrew their bid uh, as they wanted uh, a, an additional $285,000 above the $50,000 that was in the RFP and the contract for each event site. Um, we uh, will be issuing an RFP shortly uh, for the two remaining event sites uh, for the Northeast Central Avenue event site and the Franklin Avenue event site. Um, uh, as, as I stated, um, uh, each uh, event will be provided up to $50,000 um, in cash from the city on a reimbursable basis. Uh, they'll provide invoices and receipts and everything for for us to reconcile against that uh, $50,000. Uh, it, uh, the funds uh, cover uh, direct costs for the event. If there's any staff costs, advertising, marketing, uh, anything as far as um, entertainment or activations, um, as well as security and administration and, and supplies. Um, and then, um, Again, they can't, there, there are obviously are restrictions on what they can't use the funds for. They can't use the funds for uh, political activities, religious or lobbying. Um, they cannot use it for their own general operating expense, uh, gift cards, incentive items, uh, or food and beverage. Um, and as I said, all expenses uh, will be on a reimbursement basis uh, reconciled against invoices and everything. Uh, what the city will also provide in addition to the, the $50,000 uh, will be uh, the city services uh, that will be uh, related and required for each event site. Um, the city is going to waive all of the application fees, uh, permit fees for, uh, for each event. Uh, public Works will provide um, uh, hookups for uh, water so we could have cooling stations and drinking water. Uh, they'll provide all of the um, uh, trash and recycling services as well as, you know, the traffic control devices necessary to close down uh, the streets for the event. Um, and then um, that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much. I will see if any of my colleagues are in queue. Or have any questions? Okay, I actually do. Um, okay. First, thank you for the presentation. Um, I actually pulled this item because I know there is major interest on this mm -hmm. topic, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard from people um, that you know, our open street series is probably one of the only things that the city has consistently done right. And it's brought such great joy to residents all across the city. Um, I did have a quick question in regards to um, the, the two routes that currently don't have contractors. Um, does staff currently have a contingency plan um, if Franklin Ave and Central Ave do not receive any RFPs? Uh, well, I honestly that that uh, chairman uh, uh, needs to wait to be seen. We're going to be issuing the RFP uh, later this week. Uh, if we uh, honestly, if we if we don't get bids or proposals, then um, uh, we'll move forward with with three events and do them very well and and make the city proud. Thank you. Um, and just a, a couple of comments. Um, so as I mentioned, I know my office has received uh, feedback around um, some of the funding pieces around supporting um, our Open Street Series. Um, and I actually read our article recently uh, where a staff member for the West Broadway Business Area Coalition shared that 
they will be independently trying to raise uh, fundraise about a hundred thousand dollars in addition to the 50k that they receive from the city mm -hmm. um, and while I am confident that you know West Broadway will be successful in their fundraising I am concerned about the equity impacts that this has uh, for future events especially if there is an expectation now for you know contractors to be able to have the capacity to independently raise um, six figures um, in a small window mm -hmm. should they want this event in their community um, I was deeply disturbed by this as someone who was a co-author for the budget amendment to support um, our Open Street series. Um, it was my attention with the budget amendment that I also co-authored with Councilmember Ellison um, to make sure that our contractors um, hosting these events could focus on executing it successfully and being paid for their work without having to rely on private benefactors. Um, and as I noted back in December, you know, we know open streets is part of our transportation action plan as a priority. Um, it's something as a city we've said that we value because our residents have told us how much it means to them. Um, and my office read the proposals that the former contractor shared with city staff around some of the additional costs that it does take to execute this. Mm -hmm. um, and I know my co-author and I, we originally brought forward a larger bu budget amendment and city countered that original proposal stating that, you know, they would not use any funds above the 50,000 that we're extending to each contractor now uh, for the four events that were pre-selected. Um, and in taking the staff's recommendations, we reduced our budget uh, amendment to basically reflect the staff's uh, recommendation. And in retrospect, I really wish we would have took serious the, the concerns that the previous vendor raised mm -hmm. um, and very concerned that because of some of those dynamics, we might be walking into a summer where we only have two corridors, or three corridors that have open street events. Um, so I'm just thinking, you know, especially as council, as we're looking to exercise our funding, um, oversight and authority, um, just thinking through how this might have created a situation that, you know, for those that are looking to hold this event, um, mm -hmm. the need now for having access to private funds, um, sh should they need to fundraise um, additional dollars in order to supplement the 50K that the city holds and just, again, the equity impacts of that. I, I know in my ward, um, Subert is very eager to have an open streets in their communities, but I don't know if it's feasible or fair for them or anyone to try to raise several thousands of dollars in a few months in order to make that happen. Um, and just thinking this is something that we should consider on council as we enter into the 2025 budget considerations. Um, but in light of that, again, still thank you for the presentation, but things that I'm gonna be thinking through um, as we figure out next steps on how to support this initiative. Um, and with that, I see Council Member Ellison in queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't have too many questions. I have a, a few short questions. Um, you know, are we concerned with the, um, uh, the reimbursement seems like it could also be a barrier to these organizations being able to, to execute. Is the expectation that they would sort of take out a loan or fund this in some other way? And then, you know, just kind of wondering how to, how, you know, for organizations who don't, you know, they don't plan their years around executing these types of events. They've got, you know, WBC has other things that they do uh, as well. Uh, and this is probably going to take up a lot of their bandwidth. Uh, how are we making sure that uh, they don't just sort of run into, you know, they run out of cash and then, you know, the amount that they can even get reimbursed is is limited because they, they kind of, they, you know, they kind of got lost in the logistics. How are we making sure that that's not a barrier? Well, I, I think part of that, uh, uh, Council Member and uh, Chairman Wansley, I think um, a lot of that is is in how we, we manage um, the process with uh, the event organizers. I uh, would assume that those are some things that they took into consideration when they uh, gave us their proposal to, to do this event. All of the proposals that we received were, were very well put together, were, were very um, comprehensive in their scope, and we had full confidence in, in those uh, that we selected uh, that they would be able to, to um, uh, put a, a very good event on. Um, so I, it's, it's going to be working with them. 
um, as as we go through the process. Uh, it's it's my understanding as we do this, it's not a reconciliation at the end and we 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 cut them a check. It's something that we can do on a continuing basis as we uh, put this thing together. That, that's helpful context. Um, and as far as this presentation and, and the way you've executed these these these. Uh, these are contracts. I, I think the work is great. I really want to thank you for the presentation. Um, and you know, this is sort of the the sandbox that we've given you to mm -hmm. to 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 to, um, to execute this work within. Uh, and so, thank you for that. And I think that this is uh, this is encouraging, at least uh, somewhat. I, I do think that we are in a um, a little bit of a wait and see period here, right? Uh, and I do have a lot of concerns. I know community members have a lot of concerns with how these events are going to go. Mm -hmm. um, the central premise seems to have shifted, right? Like, you know, it used to be that um, uh, these events were something that was say, that we said should happen. Now it feels a little bit more like it's something we're saying communities can do mm -hmm. if they want to, uh, which is a different sort of premise for the for for the uh, for these events to be occurring. Um, you know, I'm concerned. You know, that we had after years and years of growing the number of corridors, that we might see a reduction in the number of corridors where this event happens. Um, and I do know that there are at least a few folks uh, in, in in my ward who put on different events uh, mm -hmm. over the summer, uh, you know, namely uh, Juneteenth events. Um, we're saying that they they would have submitted something, but that you know even for closing off just two or two or three blocks for Juneteenth uh, or one block, uh, their budgets can get to be three to five times what the city is even offering here. And those are for organizations that sort of are a little bit more into into event planning. And so I have concerns around logistics. I have concerns about you know uh, what this means, and that's not concerns with your work and how you've presented it here to us today. That's more just concerned with. Uh, the sandbox we've created for you to go ahead and execute this work. And so um, uh, so that kind of leads me, that context leads me to kind of my last question. How are, we, how are we determining success? How are we measuring success um, when it comes to the execution of these projects? Is it going to be in attendance? Is it going to be in vendor feedback and surveys? Is it going to be, you know, how are we measuring success? Uh, you know, because assuming all three events do happen, I could imagine it maybe would be easy for us to say like, all right, well, we got through that and our vendors figured it out somehow uh, and not really vet it. Uh, whereas, you know, um, you know, we, I don't want to be in a situation where because Open Streets has such a great reputation, you've got these vendors that put themselves out there, they run into a lot of difficulty and then next year we're seeing either the quality of the events decline, the number of applicants decline, you know, how, how, so how are, how are we measuring success of these events? Yeah, that very good question. Uh, uh, Councilman, Chairman Wansley, I, I, I think success, you know, will be in, in a couple different forms. Oh, I'm sorry, can you speak into the mic? Kind of hard here. <laughs> you know, one is how smoothly the, the planning process goes. Uh, as we, you know, look at these event sites and work with uh, the event organizers uh, in, in, in determining what, what the events themselves are actually going to look like, I think um, obviously always a, a, attendance is a good gauge on, on, on how well the event is. Um, and I, I think that, you know, if, if it's a positive um, uh, a, a positive impact on the community and and the neighborhoods that we're having these events in I think then that's that's also a success thank you uh, la last thing I'll say is I I um, I know that council members will likely be getting a lot of feedback as well about what people think and you know and that feedback will flow in any direction mm -hmm. right we don't we get we don't really get to predict that but um, you know I am going to be someone who is looking to uh, I think it's completely appropriate for us to, you know, sort of say to our streets who has run these programs in the past, hey, look, you got to go through a competitive bid process. You've got to, you know, I think that that's completely fair. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge that at least the, f the f feedback that I've gotten ever since I've been in office is that these events have improved. The attendance has gone up. There's been more of them, especially on the north side. You know, you kind of st we started off doing. You know, I think just West Broadway, we've had them on Lowry, we've had them on Glenwood. Um, and uh, and so, uh, 
And so to see, so if there is a significant step back, I, I think, you know, I want to encourage all of us, namely my colleagues, but also city staff to say, like, what, what does it take to engage with our streets? Uh, I, I don't, I, I, even though I think it's fair for, for them to go through a competitive process and be selected or not selected, uh, I do think it's a, it, it is not sitting well with me that there seems to be just a complete, uh, you know, uh, severance of, of the relationship between, you know, an organization who's run really good programs in the past, regardless of how we feel about them individually, um, and, uh, and the city who has supported these programs. And so um, hopefully all signs are pointing, pointing up and in a good direction, but I do think that it would behoove us to engage in those conversations and see how that relationship can't be mended and, and how, that, how the learnings that they've obviously developed over years and years of doing these events uh, don't just get lost. Um, mm -hmm. So that's all more of a comment, uh, but thank you so much for the presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Ellison. Um, I believe that's all that we have on discussion. Um, and thank you again, staff, for the presentation. Um, seeing there is no further discussion on this item, I will move it for approval. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. All right, the ayes have it, and that motion carries. Um, our next item is uh, number 16, the civil rights director charge on furloughs updates. Um, this is a presentation that uh, is going to be coming from our civil rights uh, department. Um, and I will invite them as soon as we wrap up the open streets uh, presentation stuff <laughs> to come up and, and take the floor. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Chair Wansley, Vice Chair Palmasano, Council members, thank you so much for having us today. Uh, my name is Kayla McCannandiera, and I'm the Director of the Complaint Investigations Division within the Civil Rights Department. Um, I'm joined today by a co-presenter, Heidi Garrido, from the project, she's a project coordinator from the Office of Public Service. And what we're here to provide an update on is the director's charge, civil rights director's charge related to the 2020 furloughs. So this is what we're generally going to cover today. I'm going to talk about the charge of discrimination itself, the preliminary fact and recommendation gathering that we engaged in, as well as the preliminary agreement, the work groups that were formed around this work, the final settlement agreement that was ultimately reached, and then I'll hand it over to Heidi to talk about compliance with the settlement agreement, as well as case closure. So starting with the charge of discrimination, so I think as most of you know, the Civil Rights Complaint Investigations Division is charged with enforcing the Civil Rights Ordinance. And how we generally do that is we receive complaints of discrimination um, from members of the public or anyone that, that experiences that in the city of Minneapolis. When I'm talking about discrimination, I'm talking about negative treatment that's based on someone's protected class. And when I'm talking about protected class, I'm talking about elements of a person's identity that they cannot or should not be asked to change. So this is things like race, sex, sexual orientation, disability, and the like. Um, the Complaint Investigations Division has jurisdiction to investigate discrimination in a variety of different areas, but we do have jurisdiction to investigate employment discrimination specifically, and we have jurisdiction to investigate allegations against the city itself, um, which is what's happening here. Um, also, as folks know, the city implemented furloughs in 2020. That was largely to, um, to remedy budget pitfalls and also avoid layoffs. And following the implementation of furloughs, there was some workaround and then a presentation to council, which was the after action report on furloughs. Um, there was a variety of different concerns that were brought to the, to the fore in that presentation presentation um, for the most important to this process, to the director's charge process, is the allegation that there was a disparate impact of furloughs on BIPOC and women employees in the city enterprise. So in addition to being able to accept complaints from members of the public who have experienced discrimination, there's also the possibility under the Civil Rights Ordinance to file a director's charge of discrimination. And what that is is a charge that's actually filed by the Civil Rights Department director on behalf of kind of Minneapolis as a whole. It doesn't have a specific complainant that's making a particular allegation. And when a director's charge can be filed is when the director receives information that an unlawful discriminatory 
discriminatory act or practice has taken place. And so this allegation of, dis of a disparate impact of furloughs on women and BIPOC employees in the enterprise was that information that the director received that spurred the director's charge itself. Um, just for clarity's sake, when I'm saying disparate impact on these folks, what I'm meaning is that our BIPOC and women employees, the allegation was that our BIPOC and women employees across the enterprise were experiencing furloughs, having to take furlough days at a higher rate than their white or male counterparts. So that was the underlying allegation. There was a director's charge that was issued that alleged both sex and race-based discrimination. Um, kind of two clarifying points I want to make is filing a um, charge does not necessarily mean that there's a finding that discrimination occurred or the civil rights ordinance was violated, but it is that formal first step in the process for us to be able to investigate that allegation. Um, I'll also wanted to clarify, I think there's some very reasonable confusion between the after action report and and the director's charge on furloughs. Um, they are kind of on the same topics and in the same arena. Um, the allegation that was made by the after action report is the underlying information that spurred the director's charge, but everything that happened after that point was purely within the Civil Rights Department process in processing a, a charge of discrimination. So that was all managed by civil rights at that point in time. So there was really early on interest in negotiating a settlement in this case from both parties. So both from the Civil Rights Department and from the city, um, largely working through the coordinator's office at the time, what became the COO's office. Um, and because of that, so that's really what we pivoted to and focused on in this case. Um, the ability to negotiate a settlement at this point in the process is consistent with the department's process. We provide the opportunity for voluntary early mediation in any discrimination case that comes to our office. Um, and if folks take us up on it, we bring the parties together with a neutral mediator to try to come to some sort of positive outcome, settlement agreement that everyone can live with, everyone's okay with, and then that's how we close a case and we don't engage in an investigation. We just allow for that agreement to be the, the conclusion of a case. So similar to that, we allowed for those um, and participated in those negotiations at that point in time. Um, and all the steps that really were taken in this case that I'll detail in, in further slides were really aimed at what could be included in that settlement agreement that would be effective, that would make people feel like we're moving in the right direction, addressing the concerns that people had around furloughs and the like. Um, and so just to reiterate, we did not conduct an investigation in this case, and we did not make a finding as to whether or not discrimination occurred, but we did ultimately reach a settlement agreement. So to kind of make sure that going into this negotiation period, we had a good understanding of what occurred um, with the furloughs, the different perspectives on that, and then also what are the recommendations for how this could be done better in the future, which was certainly the goal. Um, civil rights felt like we needed to engage in some initial fact gathering, recommendation gathering at the onset. So the first step in that process was we conducted 30 plus hours of interviews with folks across the enterprise at all kind of different levels of the enterprise to hear different um, perspectives and thoughts around how this maybe should have gone a different um, direction or how it could go differently in the future. And when we took a look at everything we got from all those interviews, we were able to identify three key themes that we kept hearing again and again that folks were concerned about. One was working in a union environment and how that impacted how the furloughs unfolded. Two is enterprise communication of large scale decisions like furloughs. And three, the racial equity impact analysis and whether it should, whether it is or should be applied to large scale decisions such as the furloughs. So while it was good to be able to identify these themes, we still were not at a place where we had like a list of recommendations that we could move forward um, to a negotiation with. So we needed to figure out how to go about that. Civil rights proposed and the city agreed to a preliminary agreement that allowed us to form work groups around these topics to further narrow down, okay, what could it actually look like in a settlement agreement? What sort of changes do people really wanna see? Um, and so we proceeded with creating those work groups. Um, and there were two. So there was a communications work group, which specifically considered communications of large scale decisions that impact enterprise staff. And then also considering this, what does it mean to, to work in a union environment and how does that impact folks' employment? And then the other group was focused on the racial equity impact analysis and the workforce equity impact analysis. So when we started this process, we were very focused on the racial equity impact analysis. That's what we were hearing the most from people. But then we did discover that there was also 
also this alternative tool that was being developed within human resources. So we also folded that in to consider how that could impact these kind of decisions in the future. Um, and then that group was specifically looking at how these two tools are and could be utilized for large scale decisions like the furloughs. Um, quite a few folks participated in these, uh, it included department representatives, labor partners, and members of the city's employee resource groups. They met on multiple occasions and really generated a lot of different recommendations for consideration. So we took all the recommendations from those work groups, all the recommendations we got from those initial interviews, and then went about drafting what a settlement agreement could potentially look like. Um, there was a pretty considerable amount of negotiation between civil rights and the city via um, the coordinator's office and what became the COO's office. Um, and ultimately, we were able to come to a settlement agreement that was signed uh, in June of 2023. Um, once that was signed, it was included in a final report, which is available through the RCA that was submitted, so it's all um, available to folks online, um, which included a copy of the final settlement agreement, an executive summary of the case, and then work group reports, as well as some other summaries of, of work that was done in the case. Um, and then we presented that back out to the work groups, largely because they had um, already invested a lot of time in helping us get to this point in the process, but as um, you know, they've been shared with everyone today. These are public documents. We did want to make sure that they were made available to folks that were um, that were interested and also involved in in what had occurred. So you have copies of the settlement agreement. There's lots of provisions in there, but I'm just going to talk about some of the, the key ones at a very high level, and then I'll turn it over to Heidi to talk about um, the work that's been done around those different terms. But there's three kind of buckets of key pieces that were included in the settlement agreement. The first relates to communications. Um, so under the settlement agreement terms, the city is required to create and utilize an internal communications plan. There's also re a requirement for training for communications to department staff on communicating through an equity lens. Related to human resources and a union environment, it requires creation of an employee training program that includes content on working in a union environment and how that can affect folks' employment. And then there's a variety of provisions around equity. Um, most notable is a requirement of a creation of a racial equity impact analysis plan for training and technical support to the enterprise um, and establishing a RIA review process, mechanism for feedback, and a way to assess overall outcomes of use, racial equity impact analysis use. And then also it requires the formalization and documentation of the workforce equity impact analysis tool and development of a process to use that tool to assess these large scale decisions that imp impact the enterprise workforce, such as furloughs. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Heidi to talk about uh, compliance with the settlement terms. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Chair Wansley, Vice Chair Palmasano, and committee members for having me today. My name is Heidi Garrido, and I'm from the Office of Public Service. Um, so I'll kick it off here with um, OPS was assigned to manage this project in July of 2023, um, and I was given a few names to start with to start organizing ourselves and start preparing for the project. Uh, we were given a final report and instructed to identify a lot of those deadline provisions. From there, this led to meetings with all of the departments to inform them of the need to start working on some of these provisions and identify like how to go about doing that. Uh, monthly meetings were put on everyone's calendar uh, and we used those meetings to ground ourselves in the work and to, to reiterate why we were there, the, the foundation and baseline for um, how this charge came to be and you know, why we were doing the work we were doing. Uh, we also used it as a time to hear updates from each department on the progress on their tasks, which often led to the departments collaborating and helping each other and uh, working through some of those provisions together. Uh, we were also very grateful to have a couple of those union reps present at our meetings, and they were always very helpful on giving advice and guiding us through that process. We also, oh, I'm sorry. Here. We also had guidance from the city's attorney's office. Um, they helped in the transition between um, our chief operating officers, um, where the official documents would be stored, um, submitting some of those deliverables and how to do that, and eventual project closeout. Uh, the deadlines for the final provisions was March 1st, and all tasks assigned were submitted to the Department of Civil Rights by that date. 
Shortly after that submission, the Department of Civil Rights accepted the provisions and with the mediated settlement agreement provisions complete, the case is now closed in the system. Uh, short and sweet there for me today. I will stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sav. I will see if any of my colleagues have questions or comments. Not as of now, I will name, I do, I have a couple. Um, so just naming, uh, there's two reasons as to why I requested staff to give this presentation. One um, being as a committee, um, we all adopted a priority within our uh, work plan around improving work for, workforce culture. Um, and this is a, a big component of that, of how we're relating to uh, disparities amongst our workforce. I'm so really glad that we were able to have, you know, this priority be um, addressed <laughs> kind of within Q, Q2. Um, also, I, I will name that I was made aware in terms of my office of the lack of compliance with the, the settlement um, at the end of uh, my last term, last December, when the civil rights, sorry, formal civil rights uh, director shared with council um, that she would not be accepting any uh, more deadline extensions uh, for the settlement agreement. And I know I, I can only speak for myself, but I was extremely surprised to hear that this was occurring. Um, and was also concerned that, um, you know, about whether or not council was also fulfilling our due diligence um, in overseeing uh, this process to the point that it required a number of extensions. Um, so a number of those concerns is really what prompted me to also ask staff to present on this matter. Um, but just thinking through a couple of questions that I have initially. So um, I was wondering, wondering if staff also um, used the processes outlined in the furlough ordinance that was passed by former council member Johnson in 2011 um, when making decisions um, during the 2024 lows. So do you mean the staff that was involved in, um, in completing these provisions? Yes. Yeah, uh, Chair Wansley, unfortunately, I can't answer that question. I'm not one of the subject matter experts, and um, I would have to defer to um, all of those departments, actually, to, to determine if they did that um, or if they reported that to the Department of Civil Rights within their deliverables. So I'd be happy to get you that at a, at a later time. That would be great, and sure. I don't know if that also relates to the city attorney's office, too, because I, in looking at... Um, the ordinance in itself, section 2062, um, the reason why I was, you know, interested in this piece because it has a, a clause, section four, that says every furlough plan shall be designed so that no affected group, uh, employee group, bears a disproportionate burden. So just knowing that we had an ordinance on the books and just wanted to make sure, like, were we leveraging that ordinance at that time to make decisions and that wasn't relatively clear from the presentation. Um, but yes, it would be great if we can get follow up and that seems like a, a memo question then. Um, and going to slide number three um, on the charges of discrimination, um, wanted to know, is this the first time that the Civil Rights Department made a charge of discrimination in employment to the city of Minneapolis? Anecdotally, I can answer that it's the first one in recent history that's a director's charge. Okay. So that's that's what I can share. So where it came directly from the Civil Rights Department director initiating it versus something being received from the public. Great. And then uh, thank you for earlier, you know, clarifying the, the differences of the after actions because uh, I immediately went to the reference point of the after action of, of the uprising. But one piece of that that did make me think of this um, was I know for that after action, um, uh, external uh, contractor was brought in to do um, you know, the work around that after action so that the information was rooted in objectivity. It seems like we didn't do that for this. Um, so I just wanted to know uh, why we didn't use uh, external contractor for this after action report. I can't speak to that. That would have been a decision that came not from the Civil Rights Department. Um, I know that we instigated the, the director's charge and then took it from there, but I'm not sure. I don't know if you have an answer to that question. I do not. Okay. okay. And then um, I'm 
interested in knowing to um, basically you you mentioned earlier that the charge was first made from the the director based off of information that they received. Um, do you know essentially you know where did that information of alleged disparities um, and the impacts of furlough like where did that originate from? So the allegation was made in that presentation to City Council in June, um, and so it was a part of the after action report. There was a variety of folks involved in the after action report. The Civil Rights Department wasn't formally involved in that, at least to my, um, to my knowledge. Okay. That's good to know. And then going on to slide number four, the early interest in negotiation and settlement. So I did want to know, like, just walking, <laughs> Wanting to understand, you know, the, the, the benefits that is received from, you know, having both parties negotiate a settlement versus actually doing um, an investigation to find out whether or not discriminatory action actually took place. So it's, I, I get you mentioned it's offered as part of the process, but it, it seems like it would have been helpful to have a, a definite like findings around this piece too. So just want to know, you know, how the benefits of this process outweighs the investigative piece. Sure, yeah, I appreciate the question. So generally, we offer mediation for a variety of reasons. One, it's really helpful for conserving department resources if an agreement is able to be met that everyone feels positively about and can agree to. It is a, it tends to be a lot faster and require a lot less resources than doing a full investigation. So that's a positive. Mm -hmm. um, we also see there being a positive in early mediation in that the parties often are still having to interact with each other. So I'm talking generally here of like anyone that files an employment discrimination claim or maybe it's regarding their landlord or in some other area, if there needs to still be a maintained uh, positive or at least workable um, relationship, that can be another good reason to try to come together and come to a positive resolution versus engaging in, um, in an investigation. Another in advantage, and again, talking very generally, is we never know what an investigation is necessarily going to uncover, right? We don't know if we're going to be able to find that, yes, it does appear that the civil rights department or the civil rights ordinance has been violated or not. Um, so there's always a chance that at the end of that, we determine that no, the, the ordinance mm. hasn't been violated and then there's nowhere to go from there. There's no negotiated positive outcomes, right? Because there's no incentive uh, on the side of, of whoever is alleged to have engaged in discrimination to engage in any sort of changes. So there's a potential advantage there. Um, but it is largely a judgment call by the, by the parties involved. So the Civil Rights Department did at the time agree that they were willing to engage in this part of the process and did and, and it was ultimately successful. But it is all voluntary, so it certainly could have gone either way. And had we attempted to engage in negotiations, but it didn't ultimately come to a settlement agreement that everyone could sign, we would have investigated. That would have been the natural kind of consequence, <laughs> for okay. lack of a better term, of not, not coming to agreement would have been that we would have investigated the allegations. That's good, having that clarification of, of the process. And then in thinking of some of, well, the allegations that were provided to the director at the time, just thinking through if there's any quantifiable information that could be shared in terms of, you know, the right. number of alleges uh, that felt that they were discriminated, um, if the after action report also identify if there were particular um, Leaders or department heads, just thinking again of the after action report of the of on the uprising, it was very clear of like this department head or this you know executive person or the mayor did not do X Y Z. So wasn't it didn't seem kind of clear in this one, but just wanted to see if there was that exploration. Yeah, so not on the department, the civil rights department side. So because we didn't formally investigate, we really were not focused on that. Um, there was, I'm sure, some underlying information in the after action report, but again, that wasn't completed by the Civil Rights Department. So I can't speak to it intelligently, at least. Awesome. And then in also going back to the racial equity piece, because that's a big piece of this conversation. So it was my understanding that the RAIA was like in existence at this time. Was it not? And that's the reason why it wasn't used or was it used and there just wasn't any follow up? So again, we didn't make a specific finding regarding that. So I can't really speak to it. I will. I can tell you that it, it certainly was in it was in existence at the time that furloughs occurred. Yes. And 
just thinking of this is probably assessment i don't know of civil rights but city leadership but the recommendations that have been put in place that led to the closure just thinking through and hopefully we never have to be in this situation again do we feel like these protocols would lead us to different outcomes um, should it happen in the foreseeable future certainly that's the ultimate goal of the settlement agreement and the civil rights department is content with has agreed to the settlement agreement and does deem it to have been met the settlement terms to have been met so that's truly really is the hope yes okay. and then going on to slide five um the initial fact gathering and preliminary agreement um i was interested in knowing how many people were interviewed to gather that initial 30 plus hour uh, interviews just a breakdown of the makeup of those people you do mention different levels but is there a breakdown of even that of let's say if it was 10 people who made up the 30 hours were they staff 50 percent staff and the other 50 percent upper level management um, so anecdotally, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but I could get them for you. We okay. certainly have it um, documented. I would say it certainly was folks kind of at all different levels of the organization. So we talked to some department heads, we talked to some line staff, we talked to ERG members, um, we talked to labor partners. It was quite a few folks, but I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I could certainly follow up with that information. Thank you so much. We'll add that to the memo question. And then going on to slide eight, the settlement terms. Um, so recognizing that uh, a bulk of the agreement work was relegated to communications, REIB, and human resources. Just want to know how executive staffs and that department leadership also related um, to the settlement agreement and making sure that it could be executed. Because, I mean, those departments do fall under what would be OPS right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I can share that each members of each of those departments were invited to participate, and I think all of them did participate in those work groups. So they were also kind of a part of that underlying what are the recommendations, what is possible, um, things like that. So they were involved in that part. I will turn it over to Heidi to talk about how they were involved in actual compliance of the agreed upon settlement terms. Thank you. Um, like I said, um, I put together, uh, I, I went to originally, um, I think it was HR, and we had an initial meeting on identifying those departments and identifying people within those departments on who was going to actually be a member of this you know, so-called core team to try to um, mitigate this agreement. So um, how that all came together is that we would have like those monthly meetings and I would um, basically oversee um, just compliance and making sure that the progress was being made to get those provisions completed. Okay, so it's big, compliance is really like staff led essentially. Yes. Okay. Um, and just thinking to, in, in regards to council having some oversight on this piece, because again, as I named earlier, the only reason why this was flagged for me was because of the email from the former civil rights uh, director. And this is a, a very serious matter that we're contemplating again around work for, workforce culture. Um, I want to know, you know, your recommendations for how council can better exercise oversight over this process and how to relate to leadership, because I'm just thinking also last year, you know, we received um, monthly updates from the formal uh, CCO, that term COO, and there was, at least from my understanding, not much followed. Uh, uh, there was no inclusion on I'm or requesting an extension deadline. Uh, it's a flag for council of, oh wait, this, this hasn't been completed yet. <laughs> so we'd love to get yeah feedback on how we can continue to support uh, beyond the closure of this case, but again, with the goal of making sure we're not in this predicament again. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, could you just clarify, um, back up just a bit, yeah. you said you were receiving monthly emails? So did I did yes I from the formal uh, CC sorry COO sure. just being like oh this is what like yes. work updates here's what I'm doing I don't recall okay. this being part of it which it was again that's why in December when I received from the former director it was just like wait I think a number of council members was like wait this had not been completed so yeah <laughs> yes thank you chair Wansley for clarifying um and i asked because i i wasn't aware that that communication was being made so i mean i was obviously not part of um coo's communication and you know monthly emails to you um i would have hoped that we would have been included in that i was having regular meetings um with former and current coo regarding this project having check-ins making sure that they were aware of everything going on with it so 
Um, apologies that you uh, did not get any sort of um, updates or information on this project within those emails, but um, uh, that would have been great. <laughs> um, and regarding, you know, moving forward, I, I guess in my opinion, I would say that, you know, an email like that, uh, at least a check-in that you were getting, a, a little, you know, email update would have been a really great way to keep you updated as just, you know, some, a high-level overview so you could at least, you know, see what we were doing and we'd have that transparency and open communication. So again, I apologize you weren't getting that. Um, certainly don't want to be having, uh, you know, another one of these. We don't want to see it happen in the future, but um, lesson learned and um, for sure now that I know that that is something that, you know, the city council is, it's important to them to get that transparency. That is certainly something I'll take with me and um, would certainly pass on if this ever were to happen again. Yeah, I think as the goal again, hopefully sure. we don't have to worry about uh, furloughs in the near future. And, and my takeaway from this presentation is, you know, council should really understand what happened here so we don't um, avoid or so that we can avoid a repeated harm. Um, also, in, in following up to the question around the, the furlough ordinance um, in 2011, I'm definitely interested to see um, if there's better ways in which the, the executive side could do enforcement on that piece, because that feels like that might have slept through the cracks there, because um, that meant we had guidelines in place that council members also led on to support better equitable outcomes when it came to furloughs that seemed to be disregarded. So I'm really interested to hear the follow up on that question and the status of the furlough ordinance as it stands. Um, but again, I just really look forward to continuing conversations of how we can do better when it comes to culture improvement amongst our workforce. Um, definitely around the RAIA change. We had um, the director of REIB come to committee several weeks ago talking about the overhaul process that they're leading on RAIA and basically what you named too, the lack of accountability or the lack of mechanisms for holding departments accountable for following through on their RAIA. So um, hopefully this is continuation of that work too. So thank you both for coming to present and not seeing anyone else. Um, I will direct, oh, I'm sorry, I see, oh, you have cash, Ms. Tag. I see Council Vice, <laughs> oh, Council, uh, uh, sorry, Vice Chair Pomisano is in queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I did know that this was ongoing work. I'm not sure, and I'm sitting here trying to remember how exactly I knew that that was out ongoing work. I think it was just regular uh, monthly updates from the formerly known as city coordinator um, position. And I think that perhaps, though I'm not entirely sure and was looking to you to maybe clarify this, that the ordinance done in 2011 had pertains to um, mandatory furloughs. And what happened in 2021 due to budgetary concerns around COVID and other kinds, you know, it was, COVID financial concern and constraint was us asking people if they'd like to voluntarily take time off. And that was implemented, um, it turns out, in a way that disproportionately impacted um, it, sex and race based, you know, uh, employees. Or, I'm not saying that very well, but um, it disproportionately impacted employees that we didn't intend. Um, but it was voluntary. And I think that's a difference between the ordinance as it was in 2011 before my time in part of this council as part of this council versus when we did it because we quickly moved off of that and did other things instead. Uh, and that's when, if I remember correctly, the ARPA dollars then started coming in and we started making other um, budgetary considerations and both council member Ellison and I were part of the council back then in 2021. Um, but that is my recollection. Do you know if the ordinance from 2011 has to do with voluntary furloughs? Um, Vice Chair Palmasano, um, they, my understanding is they were mandatory for a couple of unions. So they weren't mandatory across the city as a whole, but two unions did agree to furlough and so the, those employees were required to furlough for a number of days. I see, so it was through the unions and those agreements. Okay, thank yeah. you for correcting me and thank you for that understanding. And I think 
you for highlighting that, Vice Chair Palmasano. I think there's a piece too that preceded a number of council members like myself who were relatively new last term. And as they mentioned, um, they gave an after action report to the council that preceded, I believe, a number of my colleagues. I think you, Council Member Ellison and you would definitely have received that. Um, and then in light of the, thank you for clarifying the piece of the ordinance, because I think that was a part of how we got here too, of the arbitrary furlough pieces for different departments um, that led to the discriminatory charges or allegations so um, that's why I'm very interested in again if we had something on the books and I'm looking at the ordinance it's like three pages long it's very extensive um, and it seemed like it would have been great to follow this um, in the time um, when we had to make those very challenging you know decisions um, and it had in hindsight that piece too of knowing that these decisions can come with inequitable outcomes if we're not thinking about you know how these things will impact BIPOC or women employees. Um, so for it to name this in 2011 and then we were there in 2020, it's just like, okay. So definitely again, look forward to the follow-up on that piece and I then see you back in queue. Sorry, yeah. another question um, that I'm thinking about is how many extensions oh. were there to the settlement agreement? I heard mm -hmm. you, Madam Chair, say many, but how many extensions were there to this settlement? What I see in front of us is is a single one. Yes. Yeah, so the amendment that we submitted to the Department of Civil Rights um, included one extension for multiple of those provisions. So there was only one. Just one. One signed amendment. Thanks. And I want to clarify on that piece. So I read the email that was sent to all council members from the former a civil rights director that named that they would not be making another extension um, to the settlement agreement, which implied that there had been multiple, or again, why was there a extension requested in the first place? So literally recounting what was shared to all council members. But sure. So, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so it became pretty clear early on um, that we encountered some additional complexities that that meant that some of those departments were not gonna meet their deadlines. And so we, we pretty much immediately took action and contacted the Department of Civil Rights and the city attorney's office and tried to just figure out like, what do we need to do to stay compliant with this agreement? And it was determined that an amendment was needed. So like I said, multiple of those departments needed an extension, not all of them, um, <clears throat> excuse me. But um, it only happened one time and it was made very clear to us that it, there would not be another one. So um, we very put our you know best foot forward and to make sure that that didn't happen. Awesome, great. I don't see any additional questions in queue. Thank you again so much staff for coming forward and giving an overview of this uh, serious matter. Um, and I will ask our clerks to receive and file this presentation. Next up, we have item number 17. This is the last one, and it's related to human resource department update. Colleagues, you should have a copy of the presentation. I know I thought this would be on limbs um, by Friday, so I'm seeing this in real time, but look forward to also receiving an update um, on a matter that we all adopt as a priority in our uh, committee work plan as well. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Wansley, Vice Chair Palmisano, Council Members. My name is Nikki Odom. I'm the Chief Human Resources Office here, and I am here to present an overview of the Human Resources Department's outcomes over the last year and goals moving forward. The Human Resources Department has three main priorities. First, to position the city as an employer of choice and hire talented, diverse employees so that the city's workforce reflects the demographic demographics of the community that we serve. Second, to offer meaningful and satisfying careers for all employees through an inclusive and respectful workplace and competitive compensation and benefits. And third, to ensure that HR operational and compliance functions are adequately resourced in order to maintain effective and efficient operations. 
Um, my vision for this department is simple. I want us to become a world-class HR department. I realize that other HR departments and other organizations have more resources, but in terms of the services that we provide and the excellence with which we provide those services, there is no reason that we cannot be one of the best. Human resources is not just about hiring and wages and compliance, it's about shaping work, workplace culture, fostering employee growth, and contributing to the city's overall success. In order to become a world-class HR department, we need to make some structural and cultural changes, some of which you will see we have already begun, and other changes are coming this year and in the coming years. This is the HR model that has been employed by high functioning organizations for decades. In the private sector, nonprofit organizations, and municipalities, you will find a, virgin, a version of this HR model. Therefore, as I mentioned in my budget presentation last year, I took steps to move the city's HR department closer to this model by creating two separate divisions or centers of excellence, a talent acquisition division and a human resources investigative unit, which we um, refer to as the HRIU. Not only does this approach address many of the issues identified in the HR hiring and investigation audits, it frees our HR business partners to focus on strategic HR work in high priority areas such as culture, succession planning, performance management, and talent development. As I mentioned last year, moving to this model will do a number of things. Uh, it helps address the issues identified in the audits. It helps us use resources more efficiently. It helps us deliver results more quickly. It helps us to optimize costs, um, improve the quality of services that we are offering, and gain access to the right expertise at the right time. Later, I will demonstrate that we are already seeing huge successes in our new centers of excellence. When I arrived at the city a little over a year ago, the HR structure um, placed most of our res resources in the HR business partner services uh, division, solutions division. Um, by the end of November 2023, I restructured our department to look like this. Please note the two new divisions, uh, talent acquisition and the HRIU. This does not represent every position or FTE in our department. Um, it's just a general departmental structure after the first phase of restructure. Each of our seven divisions have had some impressive achievements in 2023. Here are some of them. And here are some more. Um, like many other departments, our, my team works tirelessly on initiatives that always don't that don't always get the attention that they deserve. I do wanna take a moment to highlight the work of the two new divisions that we created last year. First, the HR investigative unit. Good governance requires reliable and timely investigations that people can trust. Um, this is why council's investment into our investigation infrastructure was critical and greatly appreciated last year. Good investigations are both a skill and an art the investigations requ audit required that we rethink how HR investigations are handled. A dedicated investigation team has enabled us to address workplace issues, misconduct, and conflicts promptly, um, impartially, and fostering a safer and more harmonious work environment. Beginning on October 1st, the HRIU became a separate center of excellence. The investigators in this group are experienced, they have required standardized training, and uh, they are devoted to this work without distractions as they are a separate entity and the team is able to maintain objectivity. A fully staffed team allows us to expedite investigations and bring them to completion more quickly. We also implemented a case management system for the complaint and routing triage. This should lead to better employee experience and increase confidence in our overall complaint process. Oops, I think I got ahead of myself. Coming back on. Um, thanks to council support, we moved from a team of four who investigate uh, all, in compl all complaints of employee misconduct, not just ADH and R complaints. The HRIU implemented the recommendations from the investigative uh, unit and standardized, HR and standardized HR investigations. As of April 5th of this year, the team was man managing 62 
open complaints and investigations. Since the middle of last year, the HRU has been using a case management system named Ethico to log and monitor workplace complaints. Now we have enough data entered and the team is beginning to extract analytics that can help leaders assess trends, training needs, and root causes. In 2023, the median industry benchmark number of workplace complaints received was 1.5 complaints per 100 employees. The city currently receives 3.9 complaints per 100 employees. So we are well above the benchmark, meaning our employees are speaking up. We feel that this is a good thing because employees feel comfortable using our complaint process. In 2023, the median industry benchmark for workplace investigation substantiation rates was 45%. The HRIU currently has a substantiation rate of over 85%. So again, we are well above the benchmark. Again, we feel that this is a good thing, meaning that the complaints that we are getting are valid complaints. These high numbers also mean that our team must rely heavily on standardized processes and, case, and the case management system to remain organized, consistent, and timely while reducing potential risk for the city. The second division that we created last year was the Talent Acquisition Division. To attract and retain the best talent for the city of Minneapolis, we are pursuing several initiatives to achieve recognition as an employer of choice. The Talent Acquisition Division was recommended as part of the hiring audit. If the city wants to be an employer of choice, we need to rethink how we recruit and onboard. This is essential for any organization that ex expects to compete and hire in today's labor market, especially in Minnesota where unemployment rates were recently at a historic low. During my first few months at the city, I heard about recruiting from city leaders, from council members, from the mayor's office, and unions as an opportunity. I hope you will be as pleased as I have been to see the strides that we have made in recruitment and hiring in a very short time. These are the uh, Q1 numbers for 2024. In comparison to the same quarter last year, you can see that there is a vast improvement across the board since the creation of the Talent Acquisition Division. During the same period last year, we increased our application, applicant, application pool excuse me, by 101%, going from approximately 5,000 applications to approximately 10,000 applications. We are also hiring more people than last year, increasing the number of hires by 26%. This equates to over 250 hires this quarter alone, and we are currently and we currently have over 300 vacancies that we are trying to fill. We've also managed to decrease our time to fill from the same period last year by 26% or a little over three weeks compared to last year. And this is with prescribed onboarding dates, meaning we start employees every two weeks in conjunction with our new standardized employee orientation program. This is not an easy feat and something that could, have, could not have been done without council support, allocating two FTEs to this division, which increased the efficiency of hiring at the city. By filling positions quickly with better quality candidates, we can fill city jobs to provide better services to our residents. Externally, we are increasing our recruiting events and uh, this has yielded further success. We gained almost 200 followers since the start of the year with our posts reaching 55,000 unique users on Facebook. We have also gained over 1,000 new followers on LinkedIn. We are now the fourth most followed government organization in the state of Minnesota for LinkedIn. For reference, LinkedIn is the world's largest professional networking platform with over 830 million members in over 200 countries and territories, a strong presence on LinkedIn is essential to attracting key talent to the city. Our department is committed to equity. Therefore, the Talent Acquisition Center of Excellence is committed to attracting and hiring diverse talent. We have dramatically increased our recruitment events throughout the city. Since the formation of TA, our recruiters have been invited and have attended recruiting events at pride festivals, job fairs at universities. They have been invited to speak at radio stations um, and media companies. We have reached out and been invited to and attended many other events locally and throughout the state to foster greater relations with our diverse community. 
This has resulted in an incredible number of diverse applicants that are applying to the city and being hired. Compared to the same quarter last year, we had a 65% increase in Native American applicants, a 223% increase in Asian applicants, a 93% increase in Black or African American applicants, and an 81% increase in candidates that identify as Hispanic or Latino. The number of BIPOC candidates that we have hired has also increased. Hires of Black or African American employees have increased 8%. Hires of Asian employees have increased nearly 15%, and hires of Amer uh, Latino or Hispanic American and Native American employees are around 55% compared to the same quarter last year. This is a great opportunity to point out that as we continue to increase our diversity in our candidate pools, we are more likely to hire diverse employees. Our city is attracting candidates from across all sectors. The city is attracting candidates from Fortune 100 companies like Amazon, UHG, Google, Meta, athletic organizations like LA Fitness and USA Hockey, the airline industry such as Delta and Sun Country, and larger governmental organizations like the US Department of State and the state of Minnesota. We have recently, recently received applications from candidates at local cities and counties as well as public entities throughout the country like the cities of Phoenix and San Diego. And this is just a sample. The investment, the investment into HR's Talent Acquisition Center of Excellence is allowing us to compete for top talent and increasing diversity in our candidate pool which increases the diversity in our employee population. When our employee population reflects the diversity of our city, our residents feel seen and heard and receive the services that they want and deserve. HR is the cornerstone of that process. Due to the work of the talent acquisition, uh, due to the work of talent acquisition, the city is receiving acknowledgments from renowned organizations. In September of 2023, the city of Minneapolis was acknowledged by the Age Friendly Institute, a program recognized by the U.S. Senate Special Committee on Aging as an age-friendly employer. We join governmental entities such as the city of Boulder, Colorado, the county of Los Angeles, California, or the city of Los Angeles, California, and even the state of Maine for recognition as an age-friendly employer. I am now pleased to announce that the hard work from TA has received further acclaim this time receiving an LGBTQ plus friendly employer certification from the Diversity for Social Impact. We join Fortune 500 companies such as Apple, Johnson & Johnson, Nestle, and Deloitte in sharing this accomplishment. In receiving these certifications, the City of Minneapolis is recognized by organizations as an employer that is actively working to build diverse and inclusive workplaces. I would be remiss if I didn't mention a couple more noteworthy initiatives. First, Talent Acquisition, um, in collaboration with our Learning and Development Division, instituted a standard onboarding program for new employees entitled NEO, or New Employee Orientation. Um, we need to ensure that new hires are having a positive first experience with the city, and this program does just that. Second, on May 22nd, the Talent Acquisition Team will be hosting a community outreach event at the Career Workforce Center in North Minneapolis, where our team will assist community members with resume writing, interviewing skills, and our communications team will be present to take headshots. This is one of the many ways our department is trying to engage with and give back to the community we serve while developing a pipeline for, the city, for city employment. Uh, looking ahead, the focus will be on the restructure of the Human Resources Business Partner Solution Division and on a, obtaining a new Human Resources Information System. The changes I am proposing for our Business Partner Sur Solutions Division is the first step, I believe, in tackling employee retention and organizational cultural issues. The first major change in HR B Business Partner Solutions, or BPS, um, is the creation of the TA and HRIU Centers of Excellence. That has been completed, thus removing that work from BPS. I have restructured the BPS team to reflect the current city structure, with each HR Business Partner team supporting a DCOO. We are in the middle of this transition right now, um, and hopefully that should be completed by the end of the month. 
As previously mentioned, obtaining and implementing a new ERP system, which includes a new HRIS, is the primary focus for our department over the next two to three years. Not only will this allow our department to access and analyze our HR data more efficiently and effectively, it will allow employees and managers to obtain a lot more information on their own without needing to go to HR as a go-between. Over the last month, HR, IT, and finance have narrowed down our vendors to two choices. And over the last three weeks, our departments have been attending demos to see and use the systems. Next, we will be making a decision on which vendor to use, and then the hard work of implementation will begin. Once we obtain the HRIS vendor, we can work on implementing the last leg of the HR organizational structure, which is the HR Shared Services Division. In the meantime, we are working to develop a mandatory manager training. As the saying goes, employees don't leave organizations, they leave managers. I believe that providing training and assistance to all city people managers will assist us in improving our work culture and our employee retention. We are also working with PMI to reimagine and deploy and redeploy our performance management system to increase accountability and force managers and employees to take an active role in their development here at the city. Finally, my word this year is joy. As an enterprise, I don't think that we take time or enough time to enjoy each other's company. We don't celebrate ourselves and or each other nearly enough. We don't network across the enterprise enough. When my wellness coordinator informed me that we used to have a wellness week, I said, where was my wellness week? I want a wellness week. And just like the benefits fairs that we organized and managed last year, and I wanna say a sincere thank you to the city's wellness and benefits team, they are truly committed to innovating in the wellness arena and to improving the physical, mental, and emotional health of our employees. Um, and so HR is currently planning and organizing and managing um, a City of Minneapolis Employee Wellness Week for June 10th through the 15th. We are planning activities in a number of categories such as financial wellness, mental well-being, physical activity, social connection, and nutrition. We are planning activities at multiple sites across the city, inside and outside, and online at all times so everyone can participate. The flagship events for the week include uh, the city hosting a movie in the park at the Commons on June 12th. We are hosting a family outing to a Minnesota Twins baseball game on June 13th. Tickets are available now. And finally, on June 15th, we are hosting a farmer's market tour with award-winning cookbook author Beth Dooley. I invite council members to attend some of these activities during Wellness Week to network with employees and to share in the joy of summer. This concludes my remarks. Thank you for your attention and consideration. Thank you so much, Director Odom. Um, looking around to see if there's any questions, um, which again, I know we just received the presentation today, but if there's any questions, we can also follow up uh, via email with Director Odom. Um, I also will highlight, this is great information to hear about how we're getting employees in um, and knowing that that's great work. Uh, a problem area that we've had is retaining, as you even highlighted, um, of retention of the great talent that we're bringing in. Um, Cause yeah, I think Minneapolis on, or city of Minneapolis on, on face value, it's, it's a great organization to work at. Lots of great work you can do, and then you get into the cog in the machine, and it kind of goes, blows up from there. But uh, we have uh, improving workforce culture legislative directive that a number of my colleagues and I um, have authored. Um, I know Director Odom will be responding to that um, in, I believe, in June, where hopefully we'll get a chance to dig into some of the retention components um, and complementing the great work that we're doing around talent acquisition and how we're looking to um, recruit great people to come and work for the city. Um, so I did wanna let folks know that piece is not included in the presentation, but there will be um, information presented on that. But with that, I don't see any questions or discussion. All right, well, I will ask the clerks to receive and file 
um, that presentation. Thank you, Director Odom. Thank you. And with that, colleagues, we have completed all business on our agenda today. Um, enjoy the rest of your beautiful Monday.